Steve, uh, welcome. Tell us a bit about yourself and also the setting that you currently work in. Hi Phil, it's lovely to be here at BGU. Uh, my name's Steve Barnes and I'm the head teacher of the Pilgrim School in Lincolnshire. Um, the Pilgrim School in Lincolnshire is a hospital school. Uh, we cover the whole of Lincolnshire and we are we exist to provide education for pupils who are temporarily medically unfit and unable to access their mainstream school. Um, some of the children come to us with um, physical ailments, it might be things like cancer or an immune deficiency, or they might be on um, post-operative recruitment. But the overwhelming majority of our pupils come via CAMS. So we're looking at things like anxiety, depression and suicide ideation as the things we tend to have to work with. OK, so how is your setting different to mainstream, would you say? What are the main differences? Well, there's quite a few. Um, so we, we're a hospital school, which is a community special school that can take pupils in um, onto our role without an EHC plan um, because of a decision made by a medical practitioner. But you can best think of us as a medical AP. So we have pupils coming to, to us all the way throughout the academic year. The pupils we have in September are the pupils we have in July. Um, they come with a mixture of age ranges. They come with a mixture of past educational experiences. Um, it's not unusual for us to find a pupil has been out of school for 12 months, two years, sometimes even three years. Um, they may be open to TAC. They might be open to social care. Um, they'll certainly be open to medical services as well. Um, the key criteria is they can't, they won't have been attending their mainstream school. So they'll come to us only able to engage with education in small amounts of um, small lumps at a time when we slowly build it up. Um, in other ways, um, pupils may very well have um, closed their world down to a smaller point as possible where they feel they have control and autonom autonomy over it. So one of the things we do is we try to reinflate their world for them and see that it's um, bigger than perhaps it um, has been previously. Um, about one third of the pupils, they get taught in the home because they're unable for a variety of reasons to um, leave their home. Um, it's not unusual for us to start our work with a young person by slipping notes under their bedroom door and for them to read them, then slip notes um, back there towards us because that's the level of engagement they've got. Um, there's a really strong um, pastoral team, as you probably have um, gathered, um, a really good uh, classroom support team. And um, the teachers are very, very good as well because they have to navigate a, a great deal of complexity and um, at the heart of our school is the psychology of hope which we hope that um, pupils all pupils coming to us will gain something from okay that uh, leads me to my main question actually um, what is the psychology of hope okay so um the psychology of hope is a positive psychology construct and um, in its current modern form, it was put forward by an American psychologist called Rick Snyder and then developed a little bit further by others, including a psychologist such as um, Shane Lopez and uh, Dante Dixon and Matthew Gallagher over at um, Austin in Texas. And it's a really, I suppose, it's a form of metacognition. It's a form of thinking. It's not a feeling that you might have. It's not something that's fuzzy or hard to pin down. It's a very precise way of um, thinking through a problem. And um, the first part of it is that um, you need to be able to set a goal for yourself, okay? And um, that goal is special. It exists in a place that's between certainty and impossibility. It's beyond what you know you can do, but it's with it's not quite got to the reach of it would be impossible for me to ever do it. So it's forward um, moving and it's um, future orientated. And I guess in that way is hopeful. The second component part of it is um, pathways thinking. So in other words, you need to know how you're going to reach your goal. You need to come up with a plan. And um, in lots of cases and with lots of people in lots of schools, you come up with one uh, one plan, one pathway through. But with hopeful thinking, what you do is you come up with alternatives. You have a plan A, B, C, D, going all the way down to Z, then double A and so forth. You anticipate some of the problems you're going to come across. 
you anticipate what might go wrong. And if it does go wrong, what you can do for comp to compensate for things. The, um, the third part of um, hopeful thinking is to consider you've got the, the willpower to do it. You've got to have the want to do it, a sense of agency and desire um, mm -hmm. to do it as well. So for example, um, any, if I could run a marathon, okay? Anybody can run or take part and complete in a marathon. However, if you were to look at me in my physical shape, you might very well guess that it's probably not one of my life targets um, to do. Um, um, there may be other things, but um, not particularly that one. And then, although Snyder didn't um, name it, um, others have afterwards, probably your emotional framework you've got around you is important as well. So if you've got people around you who act as cheerleaders and are able to help you and move you on, you're probably much more likely or find it easier to be hopeful than if you've got people who are trying to drag you down and um, keep within a negative mind frame. And that in a nutshell is hopeful thinking, cognitive, not a feeling, but it's just almost like a metacognitive process. I'm guessing this is the philo philosophy behind the school that you're currently leading and what does that look like in practice okay so um what we what we did we thought really carefully about um how we want to build up hope within the children that we have within our school so we came up with we called it our hope curriculum and um what we wanted is something that was a completely environmental approach rather than an intervention so for example in america there's a charity called hopeful minds it does good work and i think they've got something like a six to twelve week um or six to twelve lesson intervention that you can do one after the other and um in our view the track record of interventions isn't terribly strong the evidence tends to be in the short term is wonderful in the medium term things turn off and in the long term you wonder why you bothered so what we wanted to do was create a, a school culture and a school environment where hope is the golden thread it's just built upon with every activity and every intervention and every class that children go through because a we wanted it to be embedded within the children and b what we wanted them to be able to do was to use and transfer their hopeful thinking into a variety of different contexts. OK, so that way it's much more likely to be in bed and then more likely to take it with them in, in their future life. Now, you asked me, what does it look like? So what we have are a set of principles. So the first thing we wanted to do was create classrooms where it was likely that pupils could take that hopeful thinking and um, use the classrooms as an area where they can rehearse it. So we said what we wanted was a structured um, cumulative sequential curriculum, which was the surprise nobody and that sounds very, very familiar. But we wanted it to um, be um, sequential and for pupils to remember key bits of knowledge because when we got them to do the things which are about application of learning and problem solving, we wanted to make sure they had the knowledge to do it because if hopeful thinking is a cognitive process if they don't have enough knowledge to do it then what they're going to come up with is something that's quite wishy-washy the other thing is we wanted it to be cumulative so that the kids were drawing upon stuff they'd learnt previously so when they got problem solving tasks to do um, it was built upon things they already knew so they were safe and secure in that way the second part of the classroom practice is we wanted um, there to be really strong dynamic formative assessment and um, we saw that as being really, really important because it's a quality because of two reasons. First of all, it has a direct impact on what pupils learn. The research based on it is really strong. The outcomes for um, it is really strong. But also in terms of relationship within the classroom, it draws teachers and pupils alongside each other. They're working together. Um, so that seems to be a really useful side to things and then the third component part we wanted to develop was language and metacognition so the language part of it there's all the stuff about learning an academic vocabulary learning um, subject specific vocabulary but also we wanted the pupils to learn um, a hopeful positive vocabulary as well because as we all know you need words to think okay words give our thoughts structure um, 
And therefore, if we didn't explicitly teach pupils sort of key words and key ideas, OK, then we wonder to ourselves, well, how could they think positively um, and hopefully about the future? So we've taught them words like Ikigai, Sisu, Ubuntu, um, Storge, uh, Kintsuigi, Wabi Sabi. And um, we drew them from a range of cultures and we drew them um, from a range of different places for two reasons. One, to you know, help the children see the world as a bigger place than Lincolnshire. But also, they couldn't come to those words with um, their own views about what they might mean. They, they, everybody would come to them fresh. Everybody would have to come and learn what those definitions meant. Um, and that seemed to be really important to us. The, um, the next sort of area we wanted in our curriculum is we wanted pupils to learn really strong stories of hopeful heroes, of people who have thought and acted hopefully um, in the past and across the world. Now, it's not unusual for um, schools to have you know, famous people and worthy people plastered all over the place and children hear stories about them. But actually, what we wanted was something a little bit more structured. So for each hopeful hero, there's a schema that says this is what their story is. These, this is how they thought, hopefully, in terms of setting those specific types of goals, specific types of pathways, um, specific types of uh, willpower that they deployed. We also use those special words that I've mentioned previously as a way of structuring the schema. And then we also put some uh, memorable messages, some catchphrases that the pupils would learn, which is the next bit of the curriculum. So it's not just enough for pupils to hear stories of good people. They need to, need to hear and to learn and to remember how hope the, the hope within those stories in a very specific way. Then we wanted children to hear a hopeful voice. So um, for each of the hopeful heroes, there's a memorable message, a catchphrase that the pupils um, learn. And the reason we've done that is because there's quite a, um, a large body of research on it. And the idea is that the children commit um, those messages that are in their internal voice, their internal tape they have in their head. And then at times of stress and anxiety, um, these messages bubble up. Um, and hopefully it gives something for children they can hold on to and promote their resilience. Um, we've all got those internal tapes in our head and at times of stress we will all hear different voices, some of them negative, some of them slightly more positive. We want to make sure the children have got um, really powerful, strong messages for them to draw on. We've also worked specifically on our with our pastoral team about a script they can use um, to help children to think um, more hopefully. And we also think about the other um, hopeful um, heroes and voices we want the children to hear. So we have outside speakers coming in, including the British Limbless Ex Servicemen's Association and past pupils as well. So um, on our awards evening, the, the guest of honour is always a previous pupil, OK, um, and they give the certificates and prizes out to the year 11s and they tell them what their journey has been in the, um, over the past couple of years that um, the pupils are about to go on to. And then the last component part is thinking carefully about the relationships we have in school. So it's not just being small and kind and smiling. OK, and what we've done is we've thought really carefully about um, the relationships we want. And what we've done is we've drawn upon the work of Carl Rogers and um, we want to create relationships in school that allow pupils to begin to self actualize, to begin to start leading the best lives that they can. And to do that, what we have to do is um, be really positive with them. We have to help um, pupils have greater congruence by helping them see themselves as the way we see them in such a positive light. So it reduces that gap. We give them unconditional positive regard, which is that belief that everybody is intrinsically precious, has intrinsic worth, regardless of presentation, regardless of behaviour. Each human being has something because they're human is really, really special. And they're, and they're held and they're cared for in that particular way. So in a nutshell, that's roughly what it looks like. OK, so shifting it to more like the pedagogy side of things, what do you see as the main difference between 
uh, the day to day practice of a uh, of teaching practices based on hopeful thinking. Uh, compared to the common approach that you would find in, you know, sort of typical schools. OK, so I think in terms of pedagogy, the key thing is how things are blended together, because each of the things I've just described, most schools will do in um, in their day to day practice. When you go into the school, our school, and you see it in the classroom, it's how those things are aligned. So each of them are used in ways which promote um, hopeful thinking and the, the best way to capture it is to listen okay to the dialogue between the teachers and the pupils so in an IT lesson very very recently where um, they were given a small project to do it's the quality of interaction between the teacher and the pupils about how they're shaping their project how they're um, setting the targets and goals they want to have to improve it it's about um, how they're thinking and seeing the different problems and thinking of ways of compensating and manoeuvring around it, okay, and how they're finding the willpower to, to do that as well, which is quite important for our pupils. And then it's taking what they've done there in a classroom and for them to go to a careers um, lesson and have exactly the same kind of conversation done with them again. So if you can do that there, what what do you want to do with your career? Right. Well, that's certain. Is there something perhaps you can do might extend it? This is what you want to do when you leave school. But if that doesn't work out, what might your next steps there be? OK, and then it's about them taking that thinking and perhaps transferring it to helping to plan the Duke of Edinburgh expedition. So it's quite hard to pin down in terms of a specific pedagogy. It's taking things you know that work and then blending them together. So the the sum of them is greater than the individual parts. Mm. So how long has this approach been the main approach of the school and um, what kind of impact have you seen so far? OK, so. Um, probably we've been on a journey with this, I'd say, for around about five years, um, starting before COVID. Um, we, I, the, it, it's, it's, it's taking, it's, it started by taking some of the things we did already and identifying the things that we did already and then making them much more explicit and build, putting them together. So in other words, we thought we were doing a reasonable job and then we worked, found this theory and we understood it greater and then applied the theory to our practice. And then that's helped us um, make the right kinds of improvements and understand what we can do to make things more hopeful and better. Um, in terms of impact, 45% um, of the pupils uh, last year in year 11 left with a grade four and above in both English and maths. Um, I think it's 40% left with five good qualifications um, and neat figures are very low. Um, the feedback we get from um, parents and pupils much later on, years afterwards, is really positive. So we have some past pupils here at BGU. We had um, a pupil at the Paris Fashion Show uh, last year. We had a pupil uh, go to St um, Martin's Art College in the um, in the last academic year. Um, a nice thing we do every time we come back in September is ask the staff who's met a past pupil over the summer, because two or three people definitely would have, and they say yeah, and they, and they say they're doing okay. So the measurable bits of the work in the school is really, really strong and high compared to national norms and other organisations like ours. Mm. And then also the anecdotal, the um, qualitative feedback we get is really, really strong and positive as well. Um, and when we you know, say to the pupils things like, or had an external uh, guy come round and do a visit, what would the school be like if you took the home curriculum away? They're like, oh, it just wouldn't be the same. We wouldn't, we wouldn't do as well. And they can see it and feel it and sense it as well. Mm. How realistic is it to kind of apply that approach uh, in a mainstream setting, would you say? I think it's um, very realistic. And the reason I think it's very realistic is because um, what we've done is articulated a set of principles. 
So what this isn't, for example, is like a phonics scheme, which is quite um, technical and engineered and prescriptive because it has to be because that's how you learn phonics. I'm not criticising it. I'm just saying that's how that um, thing works. But with us, what we've done is we've identified um, a set of principles. We've got a theory of change that goes behind it. We've got a set of school improvement keys that support it. We've got a set of school improvement tools that can check it. And um, we've got a um, evaluation schedule as well so that leaders and governors can see how well things are going. And because it's a set of principles, what schools can do is they can take them and apply them in their own settings so there's coherence. OK, so in a mainstream school, a hope approach would look different to our hospital school that would in turn look different to what it might look in a typical all needs special school that might be different to how it would look like in a secondary school that might be different to how it would look like in a, in a post 16 provision. OK, but you'd be able to pick out those principles at, at work. And I suppose the other thing that um, we've learned is this doesn't work to a deficit model. So some of our children, not all, but some of them can come in with quite low levels of hope and we build them up. But this approach doesn't just work for those pupils. Even pupils who have got quite high levels of hope can um, find it develop further. And actually what they become is they become really tenacious. So Snyder did some work with um, high hope individuals and what he found was they were they actually with further development really increased their stickability at very complex um problems um and just wouldn't give in so i suppose in a hospital school setting we might be thinking in terms of hope as building resilience but in other settings you might be thinking of hope as building resilience for some but tenacity in others so what would you say would be the key challenges for those people who are interested in adopting this approach? Um, I think I think um, an interesting challenge would be helping leaders navigate what they may perceive as being some of the restrictions they have, but actually probably have fewer restrictions than they think. Um, the second thing is, I think what we've found in our school, and I'm sure others would as well, is that you have to lead with coherence in mind rather than compliance. Because it's not like phonics, in the way we just described, it is about adhering and having fidelity to a set of principles. Therefore, how you lead is different. So in our uh, setting, what hope looks like within the maths department is slightly different to what hope looks like in English. It's slightly different to how hope looks like with IT or with art. You can still see the same principles at work, but they're expressed in slightly different ways. And sometimes leaders might feel um, un uncomfortable, ill at ease with that to begin with. Mm. The other thing that we find frustrating is that we think in education there's a bit of a, there's a number of false dichotomies and ridiculous arguments and one of them is is that you can't have high academic standards and high levels of well-being and we simply think that is not true um, one of the reasons we looked at hope rather than other frameworks is because the evidence base shows that if you increase um, young people's hopefulness and hopeful thinking it improves academic outcomes and mental health and well-being and social and emotional regulation so in other words it's not just um for one particular group of pupils or just for one set of outcomes um i think an another challenge leaders may face is actually hope and positive psychology isn't that well known mm -hmm. so even in the uk even in psychology departments there's still um, an emphasis on pathology, i.e. what's wrong with you and how you could be cured, rather than looking at the psychology of what can build you up, what can strengthen you, um, the kinds of thinking processes that make life um, worth living as well. Um, so in America, it's quite well known, there's quite a lot going on, but in the UK and Europe, it's less so. 
although oddly enough turkey's got a pretty strong research base mm. um there i'm really interested in the you know from the leadership perspective how do you make it happen then like if this is something that you know clearly from what you described worth trying at the very least but then you know from what you've just said regarding the challenges what would the leadership or what should the leadership look like in practice but that's actually um that's actually a really good question because actually that's something we've struggled with because for us it was organic and something which grew mm. um and so for us it seemed to make sense so then trying to help other people and say well actually this is what you need to do um for us it takes things that we just took for granted uh, and putting with another setting so i think i think first of all um what leaders need to recognize is that actually what you're doing is you're doing a cultural approach to change probably quite an organic approach to change is going to take time okay so what you can't do is put it on a school development plan and have instant targets that you're going to hit in year one okay so there's going to be a number of different elements to it so first one is going to be within your school you're going to need to increase your knowledge base so um normally we we identified it like a champions group um we for some time because of external work we've been doing we had a bit of money when we put people through master's courses and things like that so initially we got them together so having some kind of group that's going to act as um your, your cheerleaders your champions and really get their heads into it it's going to be really really important the second thing um to do is going to be about building up confidence within the staff as well so for example what i haven't said is that i hope as snyder defined it, it's measurable so there's a number of um you can get them online standardized tests that you can do and um do um with adults adolescents and children and they're all phrased slightly different so one school they just got hold of the child um hope scale and they just did it with a few kids and they were quite surprised by the results you know um, what the um, the children are saying so that can be really really helpful um what we did was as a as a leadership team is we um you have to, i think what you have to do is you have to name it to claim it so when we started capturing people that what they did was really good hopeful practice okay um we identified what they were doing it was in newsletters it was at staff meetings it was on inset days and then what we did was we knitted that together OK, so we built our framework up on what we wanted to see from examples of um, staff practice so that staff began to get it as well. We also, as a leadership team, thought really, really carefully about how we wanted to um, work with the staff because. We used to talk a lot about modelling by leaders in schools, but actually I think a better way is mermutation. So mermutation is what birds do when you see, you know, like a, a flock of birds go off into the sky and they start circling around. And it looks like um, it looks like the birds got intelligence and they're all acting as one, but they're not. What they all do is individually take their cues from the birds around them. So one bird does something that affects the next ones around it and so on and so forth and acts as a ripple effect. So we as an SLT thought really carefully about how we want to treat staff. We thought really carefully about how we were going to do performance management and the type of performance management we wanted to do and how we can make performance management more hopeful. We have been doing coaching in our school for a very long time. We put somebody through a CMI um, level seven course through it, and that's now something that all staff do within the school and all staff do um, with each with each other so it's not unusual for example to find somebody in the admin team coaching a teacher and that's really important because the impact of that is it helps the staff problem solve things more but it also helps the um it also in terms of coaching you learn a different dialogue you talk to each other differently you ask questions differently your listening skills sharpen up and are used differently um, and when staff engage in that 
in, a, in um, a big way and an embedded way, what you'll notice is the dialogue between staff and pupils change as well. So that's really important. Um, we did a lot of work with um, staff uh, regarding case studies, OK, about what about what happened with a particular pupil and why that happened and what we would do, and do differently to get them to unpick where we've been hopeful. Um, we have in our school um, this morning briefing, as in most schools, an evening uh, after school catch up as well. And then on a um, Friday, we do what we call Smile Friday, where staff have to articulate something that's made them proud or hopeful over the week. And normally what will happen, because people are people, is the child has been causing the concern or giving them frustration. They've been articulating at weekly meetings, Monday to Thursday, it's the child they mention in terms of a smile Friday on a Friday. Um, and then the other thing to do, I guess, is all that stuff is cultural and invisible, but also it's to do one or two things well, where it's visible and staff can see a tangible difference. So like a lot of schools, we worked really carefully and closely on a um, you know, cumulative sequential curriculum. Uh, we don't use knowledge organisers, we use schemas because we want to help, help the children to get more meaning um, from them. And we use those and staff could see the benefits and how that was changing um, the school. So that gave them uh, confidence in that way as well. Mm. Sounds like obviously, uh, you know, as you said, it, it, it's an organ organic process and also it, it sounds very co complex, right? And so out of those things that you mentioned as a leader, what's the most important thing that you see um, when it comes to, you know, what, what do you think is the most important thing when it comes to reculturing a setting? OK, the first thing is, um... As a leader, you need to have really high levels of self-awareness and you need to have really high levels of authenticity. OK, so that's something that's really, really important because I think in lots of ways, schools change by permutation. The second thing is you need to have it really clear in your mind what your vision is and what you want for the culture of the school that you're leading. The next thing is to um, appreciate that whilst you have a really strong vision, the vision you're going to, the outcome you're going to end up with will bear a relationship to your vision, but it's not necessarily going to be identical. And certainly the pathway that you're going to identify to achieve that vision of free culture in your school needs to be flexible because what you'll find is that some doors open perhaps unexpected ones and you need to take advantage of them and some um, come firmly shut the next part is i think you need to give staff um time and space uh, to think things through and also give them permission to disagree now there does come a point where when the school moves on that if people are consistently disagreeing with you they can get unhappy and consequently they may decide they want to work with a, somewhere else where there's a different culture. And that I think is quite normal. But on the other hand, what you need to do is be prepared and invest in giving the staff time to think things through and to disagree with you, to hear that disagreement, to um, in a sense legitimise that disagreement and I don't mean you have to agree with what they're saying but you have to agree that it's a valid um, position to be in. Why is that important Steve? Um, because I think with all because I think with all reculturing actually what it is is the organisation needs processing time and if you close down all disagreement um, with you, what you're not doing is giving the organisation the time and space to process actually what you want it, what it is you want them to do, and um, consequently, what happens is you're just building up. You can you can just build up resentment. You can just build up frustration, or even 
or even worse, just as bad, you get people who get lip service because um, when you're reculturing an organisation, what that means is you want to go beyond the surface behaviour. OK, you want to go beyond having a uh, recall activity at the beginning of the lesson. You want to go beyond all lessons having a waggle on a success criteria. You want to go beyond the children learning three out of the eight words that you've got that characterise hopeful thinking. What you want to get do is to work things down to a deeper soul level. Um, where there is commitment from staff, governors, pupils, parents, whoever, um, almost like at an unconscious level, I guess. And you only give, get that if you give the organisation time to process what it is you want you want them to do. And to process, you need, you need to let there be voice. How do you overcome the challenge of lack of time, especially, you know, in the how, how things are currently? where a lot of practitioners and leaders uh, would be saying time is a resource that is very much lacking. Um, and so with all the different priorities, how do you make it happen if this is something that is necessary? OK, so um, I think. Right, that's a really good question. So what we what we did is we were really clear with the staff that this was not something new. This was not an add on or a bolt on. What this was, it was um, about aligning things that we did already. OK, and that means actually what you can do if you're aligning things is you can stop doing some things that aren't helpful. So that helps create time. The second thing was in terms of our heads, what we were looking for were multiplier effects. So what we wanted to do was um, one or two things that would have an impact in a range of different areas. So that's the second thing. It also means, and I wish I could remember um, who did it, there's a TED talk on leadership where um, the guy's giving the talk, he's talking about different conductors. Okay, and there's one conductor who's completely frantic trying to micromanage everything and consequently the orchestra rebels and then there's the other leader who and it's brilliant when you see it on the video he just stands there with his arms behind his back and all he does is he just looks and nods and people come in because what he's got he's built his team up so they're brilliant they know what they're doing they've got the confidence so he so the leader almost like shrinks as the organization around them um, expands so it's about alignment, I guess, rather than trying to do something new. The other thing was we actually thought really carefully about how to create time. So I'm quite conscious. I'm going to say something that might make other colleagues jealous. But on a Wednesday afternoon, no teacher teaches. The reason for this is because we're a dispersed structure. What we didn't want was um, three silo sites we are one school at different places rather than a federation of small bits so no teacher teaches on a wednesday afternoon instead the children on wednesday afternoon get well-being on wednesday which is run by the pastoral staff and they do an absolutely fantastic brilliant job but because no teacher teaches on a wednesday and it's directed time still within the 1265 what it means is we've got we've got structured meetings and cpd and collaboration time built into our working week the the third thing i guess um, in terms of um creating time is that for leaders to recognize is that every interaction they have with their staff and every interaction they have with their pupils is an opportunity to build this up so how you talk to them how you interact with them how you work with them how you respond to the work they've done the work that you set them to do okay um, the permission giving that you give to staff, OK, it all builds up and is cumulative um, over time. Um, yeah, so that, I think that's basically what we'd say. Mm. How, how important do you think leaders are in terms of their role in creating the environment that you just described? Um, I think. I would respond to that by saying leadership rather than leaders 
is essential in creating that kind of um, in organization environment that we've described. And the reason I think for this, think this is because in our school, leadership is quite weird. We're on three sites and um, about one third of the pupils are taught in the home. So the parking everything we've said so far, just with that simple fact, that means the head teacher is not on the premises in at least two thirds, if not three quarters of the school on any particular given day. Therefore, um, the leadership model you might have in some mainstreams where it's single site, where the head teacher makes all the decisions and everything funnels up towards the head, cannot, cannot occur in our school. It, it's just, it just, it is logistically impossible. Therefore, um, leadership is um, distributed to almost to the nth degree. And as a rule of thumb, the people who make the decisions regarding uh, the young people we work with are the people who know and understand um, the children the best. So it's not unusual, for example, for a pastoral worker to overrule the head because they know the child and the circumstances better than the head can. So if you've got a culture where that's your leadership structure and the head's job is to make sure that A, we are legally compliant, B, people don't do things which may appear rational to them, but if they haven't got a fuller picture of knowing other things that are occurring, they can't do. But, uh, but actually, people have got autonomy and discretion to make the decisions they need to make. They know that um, it's better to ask uh, for forgiveness rather than to ask for permission. Um, they know that they're supported and they know that they're built up so they have the knowledge base and the confidence to um, make decisions then actually implementing this becomes a lot easier because what we have is a you know it's a cost uh, cross-cutting group that's uh, been working on hope it's got a mixture of people on it from admin classroom support pastoral support and teachers um and they build up and they generate ideas um, for what we're doing and the head teacher's job is to make sure that everything's coherent mm. and, and legal just out of interest um in terms of what you're describing obviously like it sounds really compelling in terms of like you know the, the kind of model that um you you are advocating um but when it comes to certain settings that have let's say very high turnover uh problem or oh. what in, in terms of staff yeah how, you know how they're not able to retain um you know staff for a very long time um and so they haven't got the opportunity to build up that capacity which they need in order to distribute leadership distribute leadership effectively like you described then how could they overcome that problem in schools with a very high turnover of staff in my experience, there are normally anchors that even though they might have a turnover of staff, there are there are people who have still been there for years who um, in a variety of different roles and in a variety of different positions within the school. And um, they're the people the school rely upon because if they crumble and go, the whole thing just collapses. So if I was a head teacher going into a school in that you just outlined there, those would be the people I'd want to draw together and um, get within my team. Um, and you're gonna have to work, you could have to work quite hard with them because it could be that they've seen quite a lot of head teachers come and go, quite a lot of staff come and go, and just think that your, you know, your crazy new idea is gonna come and go as well. But actually working with them and getting them to invest in it will be worthwhile because they're gonna be the people that's gonna give the school stability. Mm. Um, and stability over time because what you, what you want are those anchors to pull other staff members in together um, an approach I've seen as a new head comes in and disregards those people and just wants to a new team and a new clean sweep um, which is fine but I'm not sure how sustainable that always is particularly if the school's isolated and, and by itself I'm not sure
Mm-hmm. So you've given us what you know the philosophy looks like in practice at your school in the last five years. Yeah. C- could you sort of describe what you would like to see in the next five years in terms of the you know the ho- hopeful approach that you have and how do you want to see it grow or develop? Um, okay, so we're a group we're a group for special school. Um, we've probably with the current finance and human resource capacity taken things about as far as it can possibly go. We've got a few bits and pieces um, that we've done. We've got a residential trip for us, which is a, for us is a big thing. Um, I know it's quite um, bread and butter for a lot of mainstream schools. And if we could end up doing an overseas residential trip, that'd be even um, that'd be even better. Um, I think what we would like, what we have done is we've created a um, charitable incorporated organization. It's got two um, objects to it. One is promoting the hope curriculum in other mainstream schools. And uh, the second is promoting the um, mental and physical well-being of children and young people in Lincolnshire. And um, what we're hoping to have up and running for September is a therapy bus that can be used to go within mainstream schools around Lincoln and support schools in that way. And what we would like to do is to create a network of schools that can take this approach on and work out how they can coherently apply it within their within their own settings. Um, the, the research base for hope is absolutely compelling. Um, you know, study after study after study says it has a positive impact. It's predictive. It's elastic. It's adaptable. Um, and at the worst, it will cause no harm, which given the context of quite a few other things, is something to hold on to. Um, all schools will have a culture. You can either have a planned culture or a haphazard culture. Um, for us, this is a culture that actually improves things, so why not um, plan for it and go for it? So we'd like to see more schools on board with this in Lincolnshire and um, outside as well. OK, so you mentioned about research, you know, that is linked to um, hope and, you know, how there there is a lot of compelling evidence. What would you recommend practitioners or leaders to check out, uh, you know, if they were interested in this? OK, so um, Snyder um, putting wrote an article called Hope Theory, Rainbows in the Mind, Psychological Inquiry, Volume 13, pages 249 to 275. Um, it's available for free download on the internet. You don't belong, need to belong to Sage Publications or anything like that. That's his seminal article, and it's not, I have to say, an easy read, but it is there. Um, if you um, wanted to look at something that's written for a wider audience, um, Chan Hallam's Hope Rising is a good place to go, um, as is Shane Lopez's Making Hope Happen. Um, if you were looking for something a little bit more technical than anything written by um, Dante Dixon, who's at the University of Michigan, um, that's quite easily um, available as well um, on the internet, and that's quite good. He's doing some very interesting work um, over there. OK, so if, if you could, if you have somebody who is, um, you know, a practitioner without any responsibilities in their setting, they're wanting to adopt this approach. But obviously, like they're just one person in the yep. whole organization. What would you advise them to do to be able to try to kind of like gain some momentum? OK, so if it's an individual cl- classroom practitioner, in a mainstream setting, I'd read Chan Hallam's book, Hope Rising. And then what I would do is I think really carefully about how you talk to children, because that is where it all begins and starts. OK, cool. What about a leader? But then, you know, trying to introduce this for the first time where people are not familiar with the concept. Uh, drop us an email <laughs> <laughs> at the Pilgrim School. Um, again, I go back to those key texts. And if I was a leader, I'd start, I'd start going around my school and I'd start thinking, okay, well, how do we actually communicate with the children and the staff? I know what we think we are 
how we think we communicate. I might perhaps know how I might want them to communicate, but how do we actually do it? And what you'll find is there may be some tweaks that you want to do. And tweak is a good word because it's about drawing stuff together you've got already and aligning it, making things coherent and just tweaking and doing small changes that can have big impacts. That's great, Steve. Honestly, really fascinating, um, you know, to have this conversation with you. Um, it's been great talking about all these different um, issues, um, you know, relating to to the topic and things like leadership, which I'm personally very much interested in. So thank you for your time. I suppose my last question for you is if you have to sum up everything that we've spoken about today in one sentence, <laughs> what would it be? This works and you, you should take the time to try it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.